Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible class. Tonight we are studying Romans, the ninth chapter. And this is a very interesting chapter because it concerns God's broken heart for Israel. And as we read Romans, the book of Romans, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 are a trilogy concerning God's call to Israel to be saved. So let's get into this study tonight. We'll have a word of prayer and we'll start with Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've afforded us to, to come to this place and to study your word together. And I pray tonight that your Holy Spirit will be here with us, guide us and direct us, keep us in your love and your care. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Romans chapter nine, verses one through two. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. In chapters 1 through 8, the Apostle Paul outlined the overwhelming love of God toward mankind in spite of their sin. He warns the reader that people that reject Christ are without excuse. Romans 1 20. So here in chapter 9, we saw we see Paul in much grief over Israel's rejection of Christ. This is so different from the victorious message of glory that ends chapter 8 with these words, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. And so it's almost like a light to dark type situation as Paul now talks about the need for Israel to be saved. Now he says that he has great sorrow and continual grief. <clears throat> Notice, for I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertain adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. The apostle is so overcome with emotion over Israel's spiritual condition. He wishes he could take their place. Literally, he's saying that if possible, he would become a sacrifice for them because they are of the same flesh. Paul loves Israel. There are many who think that the Apostle Paul did not love Israel, that he thought himself highly, more highly than them, and he saw himself above them. But that's not the case. He sees himself as of the same flesh. They are his brothers and sisters. Next, Paul reminds Israel that they were offered adoption, the glory of God, the covenants, the law, the service of God or the priesthood, the promises of the fathers, Moses, Isaiah, Zechariah, all of the prophets gave promises to Israel. And Paul even reminds them that Christ came through Israel, thus completing the eternal plan of God. To the apostle, all this revelation given to Israel just complicates the problem of their unbelief. Remember what Jesus said in Luke, the 12th chapter and the 48th verse. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And the Apostle Paul knows this. 
he knows that there's going to be real consequence and that there's going to be a high requirement for all of the things that God has done and Christ revealed unto Israel. Romans 9, 6 through 13. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said of her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now there's a lot to unpack here. So let's dig into this. And so the apostle is... In this, in this chapter, going to have a number of questions, and then he's going to have an imaginary um, questioner, a person who he's going to debate. The person's not really there, but so the apostle thinks, here is a question that if I was in a debate, this is the question the debater would ask. And here's the answer that I would give him. So this is going to be a back and forth throughout chapter 9 of question and answer with an imaginary debater. So the question is, has God's word failed if all of these promises have not brought Israel to faith in Christ? Now Paul is going to make the point that those born in the flesh are not the children of God. It is the individual that believes. Remember, the just shall live by faith. It's the individual that believes and accepts God's plan spiritually that becomes the child of God. John 1, 12. So the apostle uses two Old Testament illustrations to make his point. The first is Abraham, Ishmael, and Isaac. So God promised Abraham that he would have a son. Genesis 15, 4. God also promised Abraham that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Genesis 15, 5. When no child was born, Sarah came up with a scheme to which Abraham agreed. She gave her Egyptian maid servant, servant, Hagar, to Abraham. Hagar conceived a child and gave birth to Ishmael, Genesis 16, 16. And by the way, for women who were barren, it was not uncommon for them to give a maid servant to their husband to bear a child for them. And so that maid servant would act as a surrogate for the family. So that was not uncommon. But it was not what God wanted. For when Ishmael was born, Abraham believed that this was the child of promise. Genesis 17, 20. However, just because Ishmael was Abraham's child in the flesh, it did not make him the child of promise. So God reinforced this promise later on to Abraham when he said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So God is making the point. Just because somebody is born in the flesh to a group of people does not mean that that, that is going to be the promise one that God has given. 
So did God call the Hebrew people? Yes. Did he make them special? Yes. Did he have great plans for them? Yes. Did they fulfill all of those plans and promises? No. So that means that just because you're of the seed of Israel, just because you're of the seed of Abraham, just because you're a Hebrew, doesn't make you a child of God. Now you are God's creation. You do belong to him. But we're talking about a spiritual child. God is looking for spiritual children. And so you don't become that spiritual child just because you are born into a particular family. Again, the just shall live by faith. So second illustration, Jacob and Esau, the sons of Isaac. From the time of their conception, the twins struggled in the womb. Genesis 25, 22. According to the law, the firstborn son represented the prime of his father's strength and vitality. Genesis 49, 3. He was to inherit a double portion of his father's estate. Deuteronomy 21, 17. The firstborn son was also to carry on the priesthood in the family by accepting the birthright. 1 Chronicles 5, 2. In time, Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. Genesis 25, 31 through 33. In this act, Esau literally sold his right to the priesthood in his family. This is a picture of, of forsaking God and forsaking the things that God had in store for Esau. But we will see that Jacob embraced those things that Esau despised. In fact, Esau despised his birthright and gave up the priesthood of his family for earthly gain. Genesis 25, 34 and Hebrews 12, 16. In spite of his deceptive character, Jacob became the child of promise. Jacob became the son through which the Messiah would come. Genesis 49, 10. Jacob was willing to fight for God's promises. Genesis 32, 24. Thus, the blessing of God's covenant and inheritance became Jacob's with God's blessings. Genesis 32, 29 and 35, 9. And Messiah came through the lineage of Jacob. Numbers 24, 17. So Jacob embraced what Esau despised in spite of the fact that Jacob was the younger, the older served him and was left without inheritance. Why? Because the inheritance was a spiritual inheritance. So here God was using Jacob and Esau as pictures of what happens in the spirit realm when in the physical realm somebody despises God. So Paul's point is this. Mankind does not attain heavenly position through natural birth but through spiritual birth. Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 18. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. 
for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I've raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills, he pardons. So the question, if God chooses to bless one person over another, does this make God unrighteous? And Paul gives a resounding, certainly not. Again, Paul uses two illustrations. First illustration, Moses. In Exodus 33, 18, Moses asks God to please show him his glory. God told Moses something very interesting. Notice. I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. The glory of God is not a one-time manifestation. Now, I want to repeat this to you. The glory of God is not a one-time manifestation. The glory of, oftentimes we'll go to a church service and the glory of God will fall. I want you to know that the glory of God is not just for that one moment in time, but the glory of God is something that is to go with you. So let's define a manifestation as an event. So if you go to a church service and the glory of God falls, that can be a manifestation, that can be an event. M. Lloyd Jones calls what most people think of as revival a manifestation or event or an event. So they get the concept, the idea that the event takes place in a church setting or in a tent somewhere or some sort of an evangelistic service, that's where the manifestation or the event takes place. But in all reality, God desires that his presence go with us. So Jones said, the glory of God is not in a revival. The revival is living in the presence of God. So the word revival comes from two words. Revive in the Latin, re mean to again, vive, life, to bring back to life. So when we go into an event and the power of God is manifested, that is not the end of it. What God is showing Moses is that my presence just going before you and you seeing my glory isn't what I want you to understand, Moses. What I want you to understand is that I'm going to be with you no matter what day of the week it is, no matter what hour it is, no matter where you are, you can live in my presence. So it's just not a one-time event. Salvation is not a one-time event. In fact, when you look at the word salvation, you'll see that it has a past tense, present tense, and future tense. I was saved, I am saved, I am being saved. So God wants us to live in his presence, and that is God's grace. Grace is giving his people something they don't deserve. I don't deserve to live in God's presence, but that's what God wants to give me. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And the quote from M. Lloyd Jones comes from the power of revival. Baptism in the spirit and preaching on fire. 
And so God wants us to live in the power of that revive. Second illustration is Pharaoh. God said, for this very purpose, I've raised you up, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. If grace is getting what we don't deserve, mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Let me repeat that. If grace is getting what you don't deserve, mercy is not getting what you do deserve. It was God's desire to show mercy to Pharaoh. God did not harden Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardens his own heart. According to scripture, in Exodus 7.13, 7.22, 8.15, 8.19, 10.11, 9, 7, and 9, 34, every time God came to Pharaoh through Moses, and every time God said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said, no, his heart just got a little harder. So Pharaoh hardened his heart through ignoring God, rejecting God, and being in defiance of God. Every time Pharaoh refused God, his heart got a little harder. It was God's desire to show his mercy to Pharaoh and all of Egypt, but it could not happen because Pharaoh rejected God and rejected his mercy. So his heart was hardened. I've often told people, it would be better for you not to go to church and to sit there and reject God than to go to church and time after time after time reject God. Because the more you reject God, the harder your heart grows. So God desires to show mercy and grace. Neither can be bestowed on unrighteousness. God can't bestow his mercy and his grace on unrighteous. God would be unrighteous himself if he rewarded sin. So he can't reward sin. He can't reward that rejection. He can't re reward unrighteousness. And it's God that makes the determination. If it was left up to mankind, I assure you, there would be a lot of people who would be given a free pass because there are a lot of folks that cannot hold people to the fire. They have sympathy. They don't want people to go to hell. And so they'll bend the rules over and over and over again. And if you attend a church where the pastor is willing to bend the rules because he doesn't want to tell the truth, then your pastor is a liar and a sinner. Everybody needs to hear the truth. The consequence of sin is death. The Apostle Paul is thinking about this with the Jewish believers, because there's so many Jewish believers who think that just because they're Jewish, or just because a person is Jewish, they're going to go to heaven. That is a lie. God has revealed himself over and over and over to the Jewish people, and they've hardened their hearts like Pharaoh. Romans 9, 19 through 24. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, you who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power 
over the clay. For the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he called, not of the Jews only, but of the Gentiles. Ah, oh, listen to this. God had prepared, God made both the Jews and the Gentiles. One for glory, he made the Gentiles for the glory, and he made the Jews for vessels of dishonor. But they are still his creation, and he wants both to come to him. So he endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath for destruction. Why doesn't Jesus return to earth? Because he is waiting for people to come to him. So Paul's having an imaginary debate. You'll say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? Paul has been showing us in all the previous illustrations that God had a plan. He allowed man to mess with that plan. In some cases, the end result worked out. In others, such as Esau and Pharaoh, the end result wasn't good. That's why Paul states, who are you to reply against God? Or who are you to question God? Paul pulls again on the illustration of the potter, the clay, and the wheel from Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11. To illustrate God's sovereignty over man, he questions, does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Who decides what sort of vessel you will be? Is it you or God? Of course. God leads us and draws us, but we also have accountability and responsibility in what kind of vessel we will be. Accountability and responsibility. I could not pay for my salvation, but I am accountable to God for what I do with those things that God has given me. Paul illustrates that God's sovereignty is seen in both vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Since he's the creator of both, his hand is seen in both. For those that walk in obedience, there's life. For those that walk in rebellion, there's wrath. Is not the, law, is not the sovereignty of God seen in his long suffering? waiting for those destined to wrath, to come to him, both the Jews and the Gentiles. He is in control. God could smash anyone that is flawed at any time, but he keeps working. He keeps waiting. He keeps pulling by his spirit. He's full of long suffering. And then Romans 9, 25 through 29. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. And her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we had been made like Gomorrah. Wow. 
Now Paul relies on the testimony of the prophets, Hosea and Isaiah. Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. Paul recalls the history of Israel recorded in the scriptures to back his argument. He quotes from Hosea 2.23. This passage is a prophecy concerning God's willingness to bring together Judah and the ten tribes of Israel. That would be the northern tribes. Paul applies the Hosea prophecy to bring both Gentiles and the united Israel, that would be Judah and the ten northern tribes, the united Israel into his kingdom. We call this the church. Peter makes the same prophetic promise in 1 Peter 2.10. And so the church is made up of those who God has brought together. They have a, there's a willingness to come together. Those that were not his people, the Gentiles, he's now calling them his people, and he's calling them unto himself. So he's opened up the door, not just for the Jews to be saved, but also for the Gentiles. And then the prophet Isaiah, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Here Paul is reminding the Jewish believers in Rome that God has promised to spare a remnant. Quoting from Isaiah 10, 22 through 23, the apostle makes several points. First, God has kept his promises to Israel. Second, God never promised that all of Israel would be saved. So God kept his promise to Israel by making them as many as the sands of the sea. So Israel is made up of many, but God never promised that all of Israel would be saved. Remember Jacob and Esau. And third, God has called out a remnant from among the Jewish people that will put their faith in Christ. So there's going to be a remnant that is going to be saved, but not all of Israel. Now, I, there is a lie that is going on in many um, churches today, and that is that God has not totally revealed himself to Israel, and that because Israel did not receive the revelation of Jesus Christ, that God will not hold Israel accountable to salvation but that all Israel will be saved. That is a lie. And that is exactly the lie that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. God has kept his promise to Israel. He's made Israel like the sands of the sea. But God never promised that all of Israel would be saved. And God has called out a remnant from among the Jewish people that will put their faith in Christ. So Paul quotes Isaiah 1 9 and reminds Israel that no matter how unbelieving the nation's been, it could have been worse. God so severely judged, judged Sodom and Gomorrah that they were completely removed from the earth without hope. Genesis 19 24 through 25. And God is promising the believers a remnant. Romans 9, 30 through 33. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, 
has not attained to the law of righteousness? Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So Paul wraps up this chapter with two more questions in his imaginary debate. First question, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. So Paul's imaginary questioner is asking, are you telling us that Gentiles that did not pursue righteousness under the law have attained righteousness without the law? And the answer to that would be yes. So the second question, why? How does that happen? Because they did not seek it, that is righteousness, by faith but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Isaiah 28, 16. Prophetically, seeing the work of Christ, the apostle describes himself as the sure the, 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 the apostle describes him, that is Christ, not the apostle. The apostle describes him as the sure foundation and the precious cornerstone. Paul continues that whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. The Israelites have stumbled over Christ because they refuse to believe in him. They've elected to prove their righteousness. You see, there are many who take chapter 9 and they say, well, this is a picture of God's election, that God has elected some and has rejected some. But the, the opposite is true about the elected. God has elected all men. But certain men have not elected God. So they have elected to prove their righteousness or, on the other hand, their unrighteousness by their own works and not through faith. Remember, the just shall live by faith. 